day, everybody. We're at uh, chapter 12 of 1 Samuel. I believe we left off at verse 8. It's been a while since I've read. Anyways, when Jacob was come into Egypt, and your fathers cried unto the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt, and made them dwell in this place. Uh, in other words, neither this king nor any other king did such, but only the Lord did this. Verse 9. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he told them, or he sold them into the hand of Sisera, camped into the host of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they who were the Moabites fought against them. And well, notes. In other words, they fought against Israel. If the believer rebels against the Lord, ultimately the Lord will sell that believer into the hand of the enemy. The only cure for this is the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. You know, if you want to give yourself over to all kinds of false doctrines and all kinds of uh, wicked things, and you want to have enemies ruling over you, God will just go right on ahead and let you do that. As a matter of fact, He will cause more problems for you in order to get you to repent. Verse 10, And they cried unto the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served Balaam and Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies and we will serve you. And the Lord sent Jerubbabel and Bedron, who was also called Barak, and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you dwelled safe. Notes. Now, you must also remember that while the Lord uses human instrumentation, that is not uh, confined to such still. It is the Lord alone who actually does the delivering, even though he may use a human to be the particular machine behind the workings, if you know what I mean. Verse 12. Well, kind of like what Moses and Aaron were. Anyways, verse 12. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, you said unto me, No, but a king shall reign over us, when the Lord your God was your king. Notes. They're, they're kind of saying that they didn't want the almighty arm of God to lean on, but rather the frail arm of a human being. Oh, what a dumb mistake. You see, it's kind of ironic. All these other nations had their kings and their prime ministers and their big dogs and their big wigs. Well, Israel was kind of a proof that you could get along just fine without those things. As a matter of fact, it was their glory that they were not like the nations around them. That's what made them stand out. They were doing just fine with God, and what do they do? They blow it all down the toilet. Verse 13. Now therefore... Behold, the king of whom you have chosen, and whom you have desired, and behold, the Lord has set a king over you. Notes. Now you have to remember, it was their choice, and not God's. He has given you what you demanded, even though he knows that it will ultimately bring you great harm. Verse 14. If you will fill the... If you were if you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both you and also the king who reigns over you continual, continue following the Lord your God. Note, the conditions are set, but however, even though the blessings of God are promised here, without proper leadership, and in Saul they would not have proper leadership, well, such blessings are going to be impossible. As a matter of fact, Saul is going to do a great deal to get people out of God and away from him. Verse 15, and continuing. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord and against his law, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. Notes. Once again, I have to remind you, the hand of the Lord for us is conditional. We must obey his commandments, and this can be done only by the believer trusting solely in Christ and what he has done for us at the cross. Jesus has obeyed the law in every capacity and has satisfied its just demands by what he has done for us at the cross, and he did it all for us. 
trusting in him exclusively gives us the victory. Romans chapter 8, verse 15 through 17. And, well, of course, I've got to remind you that Jesus did not actually exist in a flesh body at this time. But they had the, they had the sacrificial system which represented Christ in those particular ways. And by placing their faith in that Christ, in that uh, sacrifice, they were trusting God in doing so. That was symbolic of trusting Christ. Verse 16. Now therefore, stand and see the great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Notes. Take your places in solemn order is what he's basically saying. Verse 17. It is not wheat harvest today... I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, in asking you a king. Notes. This is the first part of June, and for it to rain and thunder in uh, that particular time, it almost never happened at that time of the year. Now, I have to remind you also, it was indeed the will of the Lord for Israel to own ultimately have a king, but just not now. The first king that was meant to be was David. Okay? Verse 18. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Notes. The thunderstorm being sent at this time of the year was divine evidence of the just anger of God because of their rejection of him. In a way, you can kind of say that this is God crying. He wants to be their king, and he wants to do things for them, and he wants to have a little a little buddy, if you will, such as King David, but they wanted it their own way, and uh, it's just not going to work out. Verse 19. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for your servants unto the Lord your God, that we die not, for we have added unto all our sins this evil. To ask us a king. Verse 20. And Samuel said unto his people, Fear not, you have done all this wickedness. Yet not, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Notes. The answer to sin is not discontinuing our serving of the Lord, but rather in throwing ourselves at his feet and asking for forgiveness and continuing to serve him with all of our hearts. Verse 21. And turn you not aside, for then should you go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver. They are vain. Notes. Whether we succeed or fail, God is still going to be the answer. Whether there is victory or defeat, God is still going to be the answer. Everything else is vain. It has absolutely no answer. The word vain, if I remember correctly, it, I don't remember if it's Greek or Hebrew, but it basically means to be empty nothings. Okay? If God's saying that it's empty nothings, why do you waste your effort doing such things? Verse 22. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Notes. The Lord does not work from the position of what might have been, but rather from the position of what truly is. Okay? Verse 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Notes. Even though Samuel had abdicated the position of governmental leader, he definitely had not abdicated the position of a spiritual leader. In other words, he was the right-hand man to go to if you had a question about spiritual things. The guy had put on his gloves, and he knew exactly what he was doing when it came to the things of God. Yeah, he did make mistakes, but anyways, verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he has done for you, but if you shall still do wickedly, you shall be consumed, both you and your king. Notes. This is ultimately what happens. And we must pick up in chapter 13 of First Samuel. Thank you and God bless.